the bottom of it with your host, Joshua Moriarty. Hey, g'day ladies and gents, how are we? Thanks for being here at the bottom of it with me, your host, Joshua Moriarty. Always a pleasure to have you. Fun fact, I don't know if you know that's actually in the intro song. That's me on the saxophone, back in my sax days. I played for about two years. I got as good as that. That's about the absolute extent of my ability. So it's nice to have recorded it and be able to use it. Haven't really touched it since. Um, it got rusty and now it lives in my garage. So there you go. <laughs> What's news in JMO land today? Well, back in LA for the month, got a few Miami horror shows this weekend, playing at a festival called Just Like Heaven in Long Beach, California. It's a pretty sick lineup. Like we've got a be sharing the bill with Phoenix, Year Times Three, also known as the Year Year Years, Grizzly Bear, Neon Indian. It's a few old pals who have been on the podcast. Those two guys who Chris and. Alan Paloma, who else we've got the the Rapture are playing, MGMT. It's a bit of a throwback to 10 years ago, 20, 2010, 2009 vibes. Happy to be a part of it. I also played my first gig with one of my bestest buds in the world, Mariki. Her and I have been working on a project the last year, and it's been starting to take shape. We had our debut gig at the Dresden in LA, which is a bit of an iconic venue, that one. It's where Vince Vaughn says money heaps in that scene from swingers you know the one where he says you're money you're so money you don't even know it you're like a big bear and you're just gonna get them yeah that's that's the place the drizzle was awesome went really really well uh yeah anyway alrighty today's episode is with a very lovely chap it's dan whitford from cut copy i really enjoyed sitting down with dan he was a treat to ramble with i'd only really met him once before Summer after a festival in Australia sometime, a while back, but we never got to have a proper chat. So it was awesome to get to ask all the usual bottom of it questions and hear his take on everything. Cut Copy were part of that first wave of Australian dance bands. They were the ones that really got the whole movement started and paved the way for bands like Miami Horror. We owe a lot, a lot to them. So yeah, it turns out he moved back to Melbourne and we're neighbours. He's like about a stone's throw from my place back there, funnily enough. Probably going to bump into each other at the supermarket when we're off duty. We talk about that, how uh, being on tour, as he, he mentioned in his documentary, the Cut Copy documentary, that you can see on YouTube. I'll put a little link to that at the end of the podcast, by the way. How it's being on tour is like being Superman and then being back at home in between times. It's like being Clark Kent. I quite enjoyed that analogy. We talk about limitations in music and how your own musical limitations can help define your sound and style we talk about design cool album titles we actually start off the podcast talking about our mutual friend mark baker who appeared on episode 28 of the bottom of it now i bloody love mark baker he was the one who connected me with reggie watts he put me in touch with mark mother's bar from devo he also picked me up to dan from today's episode too so thanks baker if you're listening i owe you another dinner brother you're the man uh all right anyway that's enough enough pre-ramble here we go ladies and gentlemen Dan Whitford from Cut Copy. Enjoy. Just whip the cooey out. Yeah. But, um... Cooey, that was one of Mark Baker's ones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> sounds like a Bakerism. Yeah, totally. He's got them all. Have you seen him when you've been in LA or anything? Oh, yeah. Every time. Yeah. yeah. He's the sort of, like, the new indie crocodile Dundee. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of his whole shtick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it really works Slightly for different him. outfit. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Slightly different outfit, but it's still got the sort of... The full Australian, the Australian yeah, essence. Yeah, it is actually amazing. Like, just for someone that's been living over there for so long to, to somehow know these ridiculous kind of, uh, <laughs> like, colloquialisms that no one's ever heard of. It's like, wow. Yeah, he comes out with more that I still want things that I've never heard. I mean, I've lived here for, I guess I've been in Australia for 15 years. Yeah. So there's going to be a few things that I that mm. I don't know, but I always think I'm kind of... Pretty up to speed, and then Baker, yeah. will, Baker will whip something out. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's great. Like, yeah, he he even I think maybe came on the bus with us one time. Like, really? Like, sort of from LA to somewhere else, and yeah, he he always pops up. Like, he's sort of um, yeah, he's a bit like the the Bez character <laughs> when we're in LA. <laughs> pops up with his sort of maracas and ready to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like yeah, he sort of was always talking you guys up to us and just talking about the size of your shows and everything like that. Like, Fuck yeah. He's a really good hype man. 
Well, that's good. That's good to hear. I'm glad it's not just like you know, <laughs> you know, it just sort of says that you know you're amazing to your face, and then to everyone, no, like, no, yeah, these no. guys are average. They need to work. I don't think he's a backstabby guy. No, at all. I no, think Beck is okay. What you see is what you get. Yeah, we did an interview, however, maybe like last year or something for this. It was nice to have a proper because you know you, I, um, you meet a lot of people and your friends and bands and everything like that, but you don't get the opportunity to properly sit down like the psychologist and get to ask them all the official questions of course like me and him have had plenty of beers and chats before but it was nice to actually all right now baker it's your turn let me let me ask you what <laughs> let you me probe yeah yeah let me probe you for a little while <laughs> it was good so any revelations come out of that um not re- not that i can remember necessarily but i think he really wants it yeah and i think he can definitely get it he seems yeah. like he's got it in him. Yeah. Yeah. Have he's you definitely got him? the personality and the exactly. and the the X factor. Have you seen him perform much at all? Or? I've just seen him on um on the you know, various social media and yeah. obviously like, you know, I've seen him in person not playing shows, but and and also and also sort of heard some of his tunes as well that sound really cool. So yeah. I think yeah, I can see all those pieces fitting together. That's it. He's kind of yeah, he's definitely making a bit of a name for himself and in LA that's for sure yeah that's good I mean how could he not yeah <laughs> when was the last time you guys were there or did a tour in the States I guess it would have been um, maybe sort of mid to late last year I think would have been the last time we definitely did some shows in in LA uh, last year we did um, one that was sort of part of a um, I think Aaron style this sort of extreme sports kind of thing that really? also has like sort of music attached to it as well so we did like a show at that which was which was interesting um obviously because there's dudes like on dirt bikes doing you know you guys don't strike triple. me as a dirt bike band well no no we we weren't on the dirt bikes so we were providing the musical <laughs> yeah, accompaniment yeah. to that but um but no actually strangely enough we've We've had a lot of music included on, say, like snowboard videos right, and cool, um, yeah, skating videos and things like that over the years. To the extent where now we get people that that I guess maybe grew up skating and I in their the that way in their formative sort of time, you know, sort of tearing it up at the skate park, <laughs> have been like super inspired by like particular videos that we're attached to. So even without us knowing, apparently there's a snowboard video that's just like an absolute classic that has our song going nowhere like from our very first album on it and we have so many just dudes come up to us after shows and like you know i don't usually like electronic music but you guys are amazing and i heard about your your songs via this this thing so it's kind of bizarre like to not really have not be across it but often you know you just have people come up to you or you know you have an email in your inbox saying do you want to be part of this you know video thing it's not much money but you know what do you think? And then, you know, often you'll just say yes and never hear back about it. But this particular one, obviously, just was a particularly good one. Um, and hopefully because of the music as well. But the uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's a bit of a classic. I guess, yeah, also having the song have some time to sink in for people. So they watched the video probably. I feel like with those videos when you were kids, you'd watch them every day or on the weekend with your friends when you would all hang out. So it had, the song has more time to permeate and start to resonate, don't you think? It's kind of hard these days, m- maybe with the way that we're all releasing music and how much of it it is, it doesn't feel like it ever gets time for The anyone. repeat listen isn't, isn't so yeah, much of a big exactly. thing these days. But back then, yeah, probably when you couldn't afford to you know, even have access to another piece of music to listen to this is like exactly. your music for the next six weeks until you you know your next allowance or whatever it is or you can afford to buy a cd or the next video so um so yeah you definitely end up kind of squeezing every last little droplet of what you might enjoy out of out of the music on a cd or whatever yeah that's it i know yeah it's a funny one now the new music fridays on spotify it's like I just, I can, there's no way I can keep up. I guess I'm an old guy now as well, we but Yeah, it happens you, to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you finding new music? Are you listening to new stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think constantly. Um, but maybe not necessarily new as in it was released in the last six months, but... New yeah, or new for, to me. Yeah, new um, to you. Definitely, definitely new to me. And I guess that's the cool thing that, that people are, are sort of more curious than ever about discovering music. Yeah. 
um, I guess it's sad that maybe, uh, you know, when you make a piece of music, it doesn't have the longevity that it once had where, you know, you'd, people would just spend so long with a, an album or something. Mm. But I think it's cool that people are, are curious and are just sort of hungry to hear new things. Um, and also, I guess that's fed into like uh, lots of old music being dug up, things that were just released, say, on, you know, 100 uh, tapes or something, sort mm -hmm. of, you know, some dude in his bedroom made this thing that that's incredible, um, but no one ever heard it. And then these things getting kind of um, uh, repressed as vinyl or, you know, uh, re-released digitally. I think that's kind of cool because, uh, yeah, I guess a lot of the music I've been sort of vibing on in recent times has been a bit like that, just things that have been unearthed from, yes. um, from days gone by. That's something to always kind of be aware of when you are making music or putting your records out, I suppose, if it doesn't do the amazing thing that the label or you or you and the band or everyone wanted it to do within that first six months to a year, it by no means means that it's over. No. Don't, don't you think? No, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's definitely what you tell yourself when you <laughs> poured your yeah, heart even, and soul into even something. Even looking at um, shooting stars with bag raiders and that becoming a meme and finding a whole new sort of audience what, 10 years after it was released or something? This yeah, is, I mean, that's a phenomenon, that it, one. It is, but, but those things happen on smaller scales as well, I think, where something can kind of, even like the snowboard video you're talking about, you know, those sorts of things happening. Maybe you've got to just keep faith a wee bit. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, I mean, I think you also kind of know when you make a, an album, like even, you know, I guess it's a good test if, if people don't necessarily jump onto it in the way that you hope like mm -hmm. you then obviously do a bit of soul searching and like sometimes you come out of that and go yeah well it did kind of suck so that's, <laughs> that's probably fair enough but then other times you're like no we actually nailed this but it's you know people aren't ready for it or yeah. or like you know just you know the time wasn't right for some weird reason so it can kind of happen that way as well but but you're right you got to kind of keep the faith you know maybe in 20 years people will be unearthing this yeah. piece of music which, so which one of your albums sucks then? Which one do you think? Oh, none of them. No, I'm not talking about me. Like <laughs> no, all our albums rule. Not me. <laughs> no, I think it's uh, it's probably just um, yeah. I guess you sort of like for us, um, if we're you know as a band with Cut Copy, if we're making music that's sort of true to what we're about, um, then you know you can always be comfortable that you know you haven't been you haven't duped people. You haven't sort of like yeah, tried yeah. to make a kind of I don't know, like a some sort of carbon copy of a popular record that came out six months ago or, or something. You're not you're not sort of like riding on someone's coattails. Like that's probably a good reason to be dismissed. But if you if you make something that's true to yourself and sort of has your own identity to it and yeah. and you feel really happy with it, then that's I mean in a way that's the payment in itself that you're happy about it. But um, you can be confident that that it actually was good. <laughs> Do you is there a What's the ethic or what makes it distinctly you? Like when do you know that you've done the, the right thing? Or is there something specific you're always trying to achieve when you're creating music? Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's probably different between um, sort of albums and between um, projects that, that I've worked on or we've worked on as a band. Um, but I guess like in a, in a sort of loose way, I feel like our our music generally tends to sort of have some elements of electronic and sort of dance music to it. It sort of uh, it makes pe people want to move, um, and then it's also you know it's got sort of a, uh, elements of pop music. You know, sort of um, you know they're songs. They're not just sort of like yeah you know that kind of dance music. It's sort of you know they're they're actually songs as well, um, and also there's some sort of emotional sort of uh, tugging at the heartstrings, I think, that, that hopefully goes on. Like, I feel like the best cut copy songs, they kind of just hit you in a spot. Um, and that's sort of what, you know, when I'm sort of writing an idea or when we're working in the studio on something, like if, you know, if you're just sort of feeling that little, I guess it's like the little goosebump moment or mm. that sort of feeling of, you know... Something that, poignant. Yeah, that exactly. Bit. Like, you know, it's sort of... Um, yeah, kind of, it's not, I'm not trying to make people cry or, or, you know, anything like that, but it's, I think, just some sort of emotional, um, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, touch point in the songs. Yes. 
Um, and I think that's sort of an important part of it as well. So for me, those are sort of the core things. And I think beyond that, there's, there's loads of other things that probably we're, you know, we, we do. Yeah, things you do innately that just end up making you sound like yourselves anyway without realising. Because of your limitations sometimes, it's like, this is what we can do. And that's what ends up kind of defining a band a lot of the time, I find. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I remember um, after we put out um, In Ghost Colours, um, like our next album, Zonoscope, was sort of one that we'd... You know, I guess it was sort of like in, in Ghost Colors was sort of a breakout album for us, yeah. and then Zonoscope was like, okay, where do we go next? And and we really sort of went off into, in our minds, a bit of a wormhole of kind of um, right. you know slightly different sound palette and kind of like different you know styles of playing and singing, and um, you know we we were actually almost sort of worried or kind of nervous in a good way, where, where we were like, you know, people are gonna they're not even gonna know it's us, like they're gonna be so <laughs> freaked out. And we um, we sent it to our label uh, at the time, and and we were just sort of expecting them to just you know write back, you know, what the hell is this, you know? And I just and they, I think I got on the phone with with the A and R guy and was like, oh, so what do you think? He's like, yeah, cool, sounds like you guys. And we were like, I was sort of taken <laughs> aback. I was like, I, I wanted you to be disgusted or like have some final reaction to this, but obviously, like you say. It's yeah, one you of can't those help things, being you. You can't escape yourself. Yeah, you sort of, yeah, no matter yeah, what you do. Even if you think you're doing something just absolutely out on, uh, on the edge of, of what's possible, like it's still got like your DNA in it. And that's kind of, yeah, that's what defines a band though. That's what gives it, gives it the sound. You know, that's what makes you special is that combination of human beings sort of, yeah, throwing shit at each other. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> turning exactly, into, exactly. Turning it into something. <laughs> Uh, standing in the middle of the field. That one's got the feeling. I like that one a lot. This, this, it's got the emotion that you're talking about. What's the lyric in the chorus? Uh, give up the things you, you have to give up the things you want to make it uh, better. Is that what it is? Yeah, you've got to give up the things you love to make it better. To love, yeah, yeah. It's a good line. Great yeah, well, line. That's, that's probably, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. As far as that goes, that's sort of the, probably the point uh, where I was thinking, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good yeah. yeah, that's a good sort of feeling and a good lyric and sort of, you know, it's, it's something that probably, you know, people could attach to lots of different things. But. Of course, yeah, it means something to me mm. when, I, when I listen to it. But I guess it's that marrying, yeah, those, those melodies and then the sort of emotion of those chords and then you've got to get the fucking pithy, like, tight lyric. It's difficult sometimes. Yeah, I mean, and I think also you don't want to box it into um, something that's too... Uh, personal either like mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't want it to be just about me like writing these songs I want it to be something that that kind of is a bit open to terp- interpretation or for people to kind of um, you know find their own meaning in you know, I've always liked music where you know it's not just like a, a linear sort of story or something um, there's a bit more sort of room for you know filling in the gaps in your own mind has that changed as you've realised there's more of an audience for your music, the way that you approach writing lyrics in that way? Uh, I mean, things have changed a lot for us, you know, or definitely in terms of lyric writing and that kind of thing from our first album to, to now. Um, you spend more time on it? Do you think you're oh, 100%. It? Yeah. yeah, it I'm used to be. I'm like that now <laughs> as well. It used to be, I guess, um, you know, kind of the last thing that I'd think about, or maybe yeah. I'd have like a really vague yeah. sketch of it, but often it would be, you know, almost a bit of an afterthought. Like the music would be in the chords and the melodies and that kind of thing. And then the words would just be like the extra sprinkle on top to, to kind of, um, you know, get a song there. But yeah, I think sort of as time's gone on, like I've just become a bit more maybe interested in songwriting as a, as a craft or, yeah, you know, I certainly don't think that's, or, you know, in terms of the, the lyrical uh, component of it, I think it's not something that, that comes as naturally as sort of the, the musical part for me. So it's sort of been interesting just trying to hone that a bit more or just, you know, listen to other songs in that context a bit more yeah. uh, and try and, you know, do it better. I've, it's been the same for me, definitely, as I've gotten, gotten older. It's interesting, though, I don't think that 
sure, I think I've gotten better. But then you listen to things that you wrote in your 20s or when you were young. Like, Damn, that was fucking awesome. And I paid. I don't know what I meant and didn't really mean anything, <laughs> but it has the same sort of... The naivety of Yeah, of, yeah, of it youth. really works. <laughs> I know. I've spoken to a lot of people about this of sort of them, yeah, str- maybe not struggling, but putting more time as, into it as they've gotten older. But even yesterday we were talking about how, yeah, you, you really still want to try and be as youthful and playful in your music as you can. But it, as you get older, it gets harder and harder. To, to say you have to work harder to, to get... To have that playfulness. <laughs> yeah, to get worse or like to, yeah. to, to not think about it. No, it's interesting. I think, uh, yeah, it is just some inevitable thing, I think, that happens where, like, I just think about some of our earlier albums where we've almost just fallen across the finish line to make them, <laughs> where we just, just had enough songs and, you know, it was almost like, oh, I don't know about this song, but we'll chuck it on there and it turns out to be a, a kind of a hit in inverted commas and and so you sort of just, just all this dumb luck and, and kind of, you know, you don't even really know what you're doing, but it, things just happen. And then as you get older, you become so much more in control of, of what you're doing and writing and creating and you have so much more knowledge about it. But then it actually gets harder to sort of finish things or make things feel as effortless as they, they did. Yeah. Um, it's like you just end up overanalyzing things or something, which is, yeah, I almost wish I could be as sort of, I guess, unaware <laughs> of, uh, of what I was doing as I was sort of like early on. Uh, yeah, how do you... How do you do that? How do you get back to that? Like, will it click over in another 20 years and suddenly we'll be back there? I hope so. I'm, I'm waiting. <laughs> do you have any children? No, no. Maybe. Does that help? Uh, well, I, I don't know, but possibly. Possibly. Yeah, for some people, it seems like it might. Yeah, maybe being around that energy or seeing, you know, yeah, seeing children inspired by whatever it is that gets them, maybe you, you can harness a bit of yeah. it snatch a bit off them <laughs> steal their inspiration yeah steal the steal the juice off them a wee bit there was a thing you said on your the I watched the document the sort of making or like the what was it called the Don't Let Me Die Tonight is that what it's called oh yeah the yeah the doco that's right yeah yeah, yeah that was great it was all very familiar like, oh yeah, I, yeah I I've been on that <laughs> yeah, crazy that. train you, you said about being Superman and Clark Kent that's sort of like being on tour and then going back to being normal. That's what you're referring to? Yes. Yeah. I, was, I, I, don't, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> it's so easy to get. But I, I've sort of turned into a bad Superman a few times, like the evil oh, Superman. Okay. Like, I'm sure. Only like a wee. The Venom. Yeah, guy. is that yeah. what it is? I don't know. I think that's Spider-Man, but yeah, probably the same thing applies. Mm. But yeah, it's easy to just sort of... Well, at certain times where I feel like I've just fallen off completely and then you get back home. And it was like um, shutting the engine off the train where you think you're going to get back and suddenly the train will just stop and you'll be back to normal again. But it's like <laughs> a month worth of still drinking and everything yeah. and slowly getting... Well, it's, like a, it's more like a crash than a stop. Yeah, like yeah, you're, no. you're sort of tumbling out of the, the train window at the end. And it's, nice, it's nice to be able to... Yeah, I really like that analogy, just thinking about how you can transition from those, those two different worlds. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, uh, I think it's just the weird nature of, of music. Uh, well, certainly for, uh, for most people, like being on tour is just such a different life to being off tour. And the kind of, I guess maybe it's a bit like if you're an elite sportsman or something and then you retired, like it would be maybe a similar thing. But with music, it's sort of, it's actually a cycle that you go through each time you, you make a, an album or a piece of music. You then go out and disappear for like a year. Yeah. Like traveling all around the place, and you know every place you go to, you're sort of the center of attention. You know, you're in some weird town, and and everyone's there for you. And it's like, hey, you know, come to my bar after the show. Like, you know, let's do shots. You know, it's sort of just like this nonstop party. And then, as you know, you reach the end of the tour, and then you're sort of back home, and it's like you know, you're in the supermarket no one buying kitty you're litter. A hero, hero anymore? Yeah, I know. That's right. It's a little bit bizarre. How long do you think you do it for? Is there more records you haven't done, more things you've, you want? You know, is there a, an end point? Do you see anything like that? I don't know. I mean, I think the, the thing for me is I didn't actually get into music 
initially thinking it was a career. I just sort of was interested in music. So I was doing a graphic design degree, yeah, sort of do, like basically at art school, um, doing graphic design. And that was sort of, you know, I thought that's, that's what I'm going to be doing. But as I was sort of uh, midway through that, I was just kind of getting interested in music a bit more and started sort of DJing, did like a radio show, like a student radio show and okay. and um, and kind of was collecting records and just sort of started to get a bit more into it. And then the extension from that was then to start noodling around with a, with a keyboard and a drum machine. And Had you sort played of- keys growing up or...? No, no. I, I think so I, no my music. parents tried to teach me uh, piano at one stage or, or sort of keyboard and, and that lasted, you know, not very long. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, not at all. I think it, I don't, I'm, I'm really not sure what the reason was for me just all of a sudden getting interested in music. I think it was sort of, yeah, maybe it was just friends of mine like mm-hmm. towards the end of high school or in, in uni that were into certain and what, musical... What, you got a program to make music on as well. What would it have been then? Pro Tools? Uh, it was Cubase. Cubase. So right. like a very primitive early version of Cubase. Okay. Um, but it was sort of it was one that that had like a pretty good audio engine on it, so you could kind of you know sample with it and do um, you know a lot of the stuff that you do today. Obviously, like mm-hmm. um, a bit slower, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so I sort of had that and, and I guess that was sort of a bit of a gateway into it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, basically I didn't, I didn't get into to sort of music thinking, oh, here's a career. I just was kind of interested in it. And, and I guess maybe that's a good thing, like getting into something purely because you're interested in it. And then I think, you know, I'd, I basically uh, got out of uni, started a design business with one of my um, good friends from uni, which is sort of... We ran for like sort of eight or nine years together. And then at that point, I think Cut Copy had been going for a little while and had started to, you know, gotten signed and it sort of started to to kind of become a bit of a known thing. And the opportunity came up to go on tour overseas quite a bit and, you know, really kind of, uh, you know, see where things might go. And, and at that point, I sort of jumped off the, the design wagon onto the music wagon and that's sort of where I've been ever since. But um, But I didn't, yeah, I didn't go into it thinking you know, music's going to be this lifetime thing. So I think, okay. I think for me, I, I sort of, I could imagine sort of doing music, you know, further into the future and, you know, even if it becomes not the main thing that I'm doing at some point, like it would still be something I'd want to do, I think, for fun. Yeah, but sort of what, is this something that you, for me, music is the thing I'm obsessed with and it's always there and I can't stop it. Is, do you have that, is it with design or is it art or... Is, is there something that's bubbling away in you constantly? I mean, I think music for sure. It is like music. It definitely is music. Um, and I think, I think maybe the design one is a bit dormant at the moment because uh, yeah, my peer group really for the last sort of you know, eight or ten years has been all sort of music people. Yeah, yeah I know. So, that's so it's hard to kind of like uh, yeah, think about anything else. But, um, but yeah, definitely, definitely music and, you know, you know, on the way here, like, you know, I was listening to, <laughs> to Spotify or whatever, listening to something. So it's just like every moment of the day has got like, yeah, it you know, something. Stop, does it? Uh, are, you a, are you an optimistic, pessimistic guy when it comes to humanity? The planet, where we're going, are we going to topple off the edge? Are we going to make it? I mean, I think I'm, I'm actually an optimist in life, but I don't know how optimistic I am about us, <laughs> you know, toppling off the planet. I've got a feeling maybe we're... We're teetering. We're struggling a little bit, yeah. Um, or maybe it's one of those things where something significantly worse than what's currently happening needs to happen for everyone to sort of wake up and realise that maybe we need to change a few things about mm-hmm. the way people are living and um, you know, making things a bit more sustainable. Do you feel a need as a, an artist to, ex- to express that? Do you, do you preach in any way? Do you, do you think people should? I mean, I, historically we haven't been like a political band. I guess we, we sort of fit more in, I guess, in line with a lot of kind of dance music artists where 
like the music we make is more of an escape, you know. Like you know, when disco started, it's like you know people can just lose themselves on the dance floor yeah, for, from yeah. different spheres of life, and that's kind of you know that's its own kind of um, therapy in a way for people. Which hopefully you know we've definitely you know over the years sort of had people come up to us and say, wow, you know your music got us through this crazy dark time, or you know it, it can really sort of help people in that way. So I think that's what we've done, maybe more so than than being sort of politically active in an overt way, or you know, in terms of the songwriting and and that kind of thing. Do you ever do you ever feel being an artist that it is sort of a superfluous or flippant career that you could be out there saving people with AIDS or doing something else? I, I wonder about this myself. I, I always think that. Yeah, no, definitely, because my my partner is actually a, a scientist, so she's researching. You know, diabetes. Oh, you just date heart someone disease. who does it then. That's then. right, exactly. That's my contribution, <laughs> being the plus one. <laughs> I just cook her dinner at night. <laughs> yeah. My ex girlfriend was a good humanitarian. That felt good when I was with her for, for those reasons. And then I'm back to just me. I'm like, fuck, I've got to do yeah. something. Got to get some, some credits. Yeah, I know. <laughs> some humanity credits. Got to give back in some way. Yeah, well, it's hard. I, even yesterday, I was interviewing another friend talking about how, you know, you can get so caught up in the the album and the song and obsessing over the, the details. But art, for the most part, I mean, this sort of art anyway, is not a necessity. It's like after people have food and shelter and all of that, then the art comes on top of that. And it's funny being in that business. Yeah, I guess that's and, true. But then, yeah. No, I guess you're right. But, um, but I don't but need to belittle sort of, it in any way because it is important as well. No, but I also think about it like in terms of how ancient music is mm -hmm. so so i guess you know science and all these things are uh, incredible and sort of con contributing so much to humanity but they actually haven't existed for that long uh whereas music kind of goes back to you know it's very true isn't it you know many you know hundreds of thousands of years um as i guess you know sort of storytelling and kind of a communal thing you know creates community and um you know, there's a lot of things, you know, as you can tell, I've thought about this. I've tried to yeah. justify it to myself, you know, it's kind of why being I a drunk podcast idiot weekend. on stage most <laughs> nights. Um, but, but yeah, basically, I think there is, despite, you know, on the face of it, sort of seeming a little bit sort of superficial or um, maybe not as serious, like there, there is probably some greater societal benefit to, to what musicians do and, and what, what we do. I, I mean, you, you know, you know what it's meant to you throughout the years. Like people mentioning that your the rec, you know, one of your records or something has helped them through dark times. I've definitely had the same experience myself. There's plenty of artists that have really been there to just be a voice for your anguish at, at moments, or for your joy or sorrow, to have them sort of express the same feelings that you have. It's like the message in the bottle thing, where someone's just put the song out and sent it out into the world and then you find it. I'm like, oh, I'm not, I'm not alone. So in that way, it's, it definitely is important. I guess it's just hard sometimes when you're... It's good you get to play shows and see people turn up. Yeah, and I think that's, this, that that's a pretty key part of it. That's, yeah. that's the sort of like... That's where the probably the dialogue or the conversation happens between you and the, the totally. people that are, you know, absorbing what you're making. Yeah, it's, it's pretty just, cool. It's all just kind of a little ambiguous until that that point. Like you, you make it, they pop it up on Spotify. You see some numbers tick over, but apart from that, you don't yeah. really know what. It's what does doing. that even mean? Yeah, <laughs> what is it doing to people? Yeah, and I wonder if it's sort of you don't know until the. And also, I think about you know, I'm I'm a pretty, I can be sort of a fairly reserved person when it comes to you know if I see someone that's famous or like has made some art that I really like. Like, I won't necessarily go straight up to them and say, you're amazing. Mm -hmm. So I think, I guess you've got to bear that in mind as well. That There's probably a there's lot of people... There's plenty of people out there who want to tell us we're amazing. Yeah, yeah. And they just haven't done it yet because they're too shy. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so if you listen to this podcast, come up to yeah, come uh, up Josh and, come up and Dan. And say, yeah. <laughs> Don't uh, be afraid when I'm in the, <laughs> in the Peter detergent Monty's. aisle at, at Peter Monty's. <laughs> I think what I was going to say before is... This seems like there's a lot of design in your music, though, in the music videos, in the album covers, and it seems like you're, you, that's a part, quite a part of what you do. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, I guess that's probably the one design job that I still have uh, consistently is, is sort of doing artwork for the band and for, well, certainly all our, our album covers. Mm. Um, and and probably, probably even beyond that, like, you know, maybe just some sort of uh, attitude to, to making the music as well where I guess design is sort of a little bit self-aware or like, you know, you kind of... Um, like sonic, sonic, sonic design. Sorry, sonic design. Oh yeah, sonic it, design. Yeah, I, I, there's a bit of that going on. I, with I can music. see that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also just like in terms of like it's intertextual. Like you sort of like music can can have sort of like an you know a bit of this and a bit of that. Like sort of elements from different eras. Like something old, something new. Things that that kind of come together, Frankenstein like to create like something you didn't expect or. Mm. Um, and I think that that's sort of true of design and, and sort of true in music, well, certainly for us um, over a period of time. Because I think, um, yeah, like, I, you know, the music that I listen to is so broad. Like there's a lot of, you know, modern stuff that I love and, you know, listen to new stuff all the time. But then so many things that are much older and, you know, listen to a lot of old vinyl and things that I've accumulated over the years. And, and so like often the ideas that end up in our music are from, different eras, different styles, different places. And, um, and that, I think, is a, you know, a lot like design in some yeah, ways, just sort of piecing together things. Are you coming up with song titles before you make songs? Or you always this? You've got some very interesting and cool <laughs> song titles. It's a, I feel like it's a thing, and even with your al- uh, album titles as well, like Haiku from Zero. What what does that mean? Or is it just something that you see looks cool, feels cool, interesting? Oh, I mean, I think probably on some level, you always want your album title to sound cool or look yeah. cool. But uh, but no, it was more. I think. Um, I think sort of like I had a brainstorm after we'd finished the album, so it wasn't a title that existed before we'd sort of finished all the music, but but just sort of thinking about the themes and it was sort of funny with the last album that we made because we we didn't we didn't talk so much about um, you know what kind of stylistic direction we were going in or what you had know. you talked like that before in the past or it's yeah yeah we would sort of be conscious like oh this is you know we're kind of combining this sort of weird like. 90s well free your mind's very conceptually you, yeah I stylistically think, aware, yeah like yeah. summer of love manchester kind yeah, of thing. yeah yeah a big part of that yeah exactly so so i guess in the past we've done a bit of that and maybe the last album was getting away from that where we were just like let's not base this on a particular style or you know we didn't want to be defined by you know maybe influences or um uh yeah sort of things that that we were listening to at the time. So so let's just sort of go in and make music like like cut copy and yes. see what that, that is. So I think that's sort of, um, yeah, on the last album we definitely kind of tried to get away from from maybe being the sum of, of different sort of influences and be sort of ourselves and see what, what that was. But, yeah. but basically the haiku from Zero idea was like going back through the songs, having finished them and going, okay, well, what, you know, I know we were being not conscious of style, but what, Actually, what is this? Because we hadn't really talked about it much. And I just started to notice, say, lyrically through a lot of the songs, this sort of, you know, just slightly, like a, almost like an anxiety or sort of a weird um, pondering on sort of the modern digital world that we're in uh, and kind of the, uh, yeah, I guess the the sort of big build up of sort of images and ideas and pop-up ads and things that, assault you every day uh, online and kind of yeah, just... Yeah, you were kind of mentioning that in the documentary a wee bit, weren't you? Yeah, so so I guess that that sort of experience, which is sort of a new one and has crept up on us probably without us really having much time to think about it. Like all of a sudden, that, that's how <laughs> we're living. You know, it's very true. Yeah, we've got screens with us every moment of the day and we're, you know, that's, that's how we live our lives. So I think it was just sort of talking about that a little bit. So the haiku from zero idea was just this idea of sort of just all of us, you know, being in that world and seeing this weird sort of random assortment of, of things coming at you, but sort of seeing a, a beauty in that, like in, in the chaos that, that, that we're in, 
So it's not necessarily like it's a bad thing being surrounded by all this weird stuff, but it's like be, being aware of it and sort of seeing a sort of strange, you know, random beauty to it. Yeah, it definitely feels like more, well, maybe it's just the people I hang out with. I don't know. There's a lot of talk of the, the danger of it or the sort of uh, negative effects that it's having, but that is a cool way to look at it. It's yeah, there, there's of course there's some there is some beauty in it, isn't there? Yeah, everyone kind of well, it's like found art or something, you know. I guess in that in that sense where things, you know, you find like a couple of things discarded in the street, and it's like actually, you know, that's amazing. Like yeah, Marcel Duchamp can... with his you know urinal or something. Like anything can be art, but um, but yeah, I guess like my thing was just being a bit like not necessarily. Um, saying that it's negative or positive, but just sort of seeing sort of uh, something interesting in it. Yeah. Is there a, sort of something you want people to take away from your art or your music? Oh, I feel like that's for everyone to decide for themselves or to feel for themselves. Is, is there something you always need to put into it before you can sign off on it? Is there sort of an ethic of some kind? Uh, I mean, I think not really. I'm just sort of conscious of of trying not to sort of repeat myself, um, and for you know, as a band, for us to repeat ourselves. You know, I think sort of trying to move forward in certain ways, even if they're you know, even if it's sort of like a well worn path of you know, stylistically ways that that we make music. Like you've got to be saying something different. I think. Um, each time you you make something, so so I guess I'm sort of conscious of that. But I don't know, you yeah, don't know whether I've got like a particular, you know, like a ethos or anything. No, I don't think it's as 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 serious as that. No, no, I just I just hope that people kind of on some level are a little bit moved by our music. Yeah. So that's that's sort of the main thing. I don't want it to just wash over people and just be like, huh, you know. <laughs> no, apathy is the worst response. You want them to kind of love you or hate you. Exactly, exactly. I want a reaction of some kind. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's definitely what defines you. If you do, you, do you have any other hobbies? Or what, what else are you doing when you're not doing music? Uh, I mean, I really enjoy um, cooking. Okay. Um, particularly, obviously, that's like in the Clark Kent home time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, do you wear glasses? <laughs> no, I don't. Okay. But I probably should to really get into character. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I do that a bit. I think just obviously like everyone spending so much time on a computer, like doing doing music and, you know, responding to email or whatever it is that you're doing throughout the day. It's nice to have something that's you do with your hands that takes you away from that environment and is kind of slow, like it's like you're forced to slow down a little bit. Yeah, I need to do more of that. I don't know what my slowdown is. I was cooking for a while and then I just got... It was too slow. It was too, yeah, it's like, this is just getting in the way. I should be still working on songs. I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to es- escape sometimes. But yeah, it's important, isn't it? To, yeah. And I think also, yeah, art and music and all that needs, you need time away from it and it needs space. If you just yeah. keep picking at it, it can just get worse and worse. Yeah, well, you can work yourself into a bit of a hole without yeah. even realizing it sometimes. But I think, yeah, just just having things that, that change, like even if they're still musical things, that change your way of working or thinking. Like I quite like um, like modular synthesis, like the, you know, this has been this big um, sort of trend with people using like Eurorack, which is like a format of modular synthesis okay. over the last sort of, um, you know, six or eight years. Um, and basically, you know, that's sort of almost similar to cooking in a way. Like I think about it in the same way where it's like it's very manual, hands-on, you're throwing in different elements to sort of create something, you know, in a different way each time. So you're like, you know, patching together these different modules to create like a different sound or a different idea and you're not looking at a screen. So it's sort of, I think, you know, in some ways shares a bit of that same therapy for me, even though it's still a musical thing. It's kind of, um, you're taken away from your usual way of working musically or thinking mm-hmm. musically. So, you know, you can have these weird happy accidents that happen and, I remember Tom Waits reading some interview with him saying that like as soon as a an instrument or or well, your approach to making music becomes a little too comfortable or too easy, you have to switch it 
somewhere else where you're fighting or it's doing something different that you don't quite understand and that's where you'll find a new way to create something fresh. Yeah, it's got to be a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. I think. Do you, you, you don't uh, want for inspiration? You always find yourself, maybe not always inspired, but you, you don't have an, an issue sort of keeping on an artistic path in that way? Oh, I mean, I think it, it is tricky in a way. Like, obviously, like the longer that you make music, like it's harder to feel like you're doing something new each time. And I guess that's what I was talking about before, like the trying to make something new each time is, is a challenge or can be a challenge. Um, and I certainly have no trouble starting ideas, just whether or not they reach <laughs> the point where they're, they're actually feeling, you know, inspiring enough to, to finish. So, um, so I guess that's the challenge, like, you know, almost you, like feeling inspired from that, that sort of initial idea but you're good at, at, at finding new ways to keep moving forward. Like you're saying, you play with the modular synthesizer or something. There's a motivation in you that keeps you looking for that inspiration? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think... Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's just what, what I've done for so long now that it's just sort of, you know, it feels like the natural thing to do yeah. to keep sort of searching for the next thing. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like uh, sometimes you've almost got to separate yourself from, from your musical project and just think about it as just, you know, you're just you noodling around. Mm -hmm. it's not, it's forget about cut copy or forget about whatever it is that you do. It's like actually, you know, what would you find interesting in this moment? Don't worry about what anyone else wants to hear or thinks or whatever. So sometimes that's something you forget that you're actually just, you know, a human being sort of hoping <laughs> hoping to enjoy making music um so so sometimes you, you've got to just like give yourself a break and and sort of like yeah not worry about all this other stuff like just just noodle around you know tinkle about on a piano or on a synth or whatever and and often that's the best way to to work your way out of a, a funk yes yeah there is so much um yeah, you 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 got to get the brain out of the way, don't yeah. you? Yeah, <laughs> the ego. Yeah, and I think you also. It's funny though. I, I worry you'll be making a demo, and you'll, you know, it's a bit crap, but you know it could be something good. But I'll sort of think I just don't want anyone to hear it in this stage. It's like don't fucking worry about it, man. Just keep pushing through, and you know that it can get to something. You don't have to play it to anybody. No, don't. Be embarrassed of what, yeah, what it is at the moment because it's what it could become. Yeah, it's, but it's really counterproductive because yeah. you can spend weeks in that sort of, you know, in between zone, just being unsure whether something's good enough. And it's like, well, until you actually finish making your demo or your thing, like you're not going to find out if it's good or or bad or whatever. Like you might as well just forget about it and just get on with making something. <laughs> I remember I was, um, what's his name, Brian Burton, Danger Mouse was talking about his iPhone demos and he was terrified and even in the interview that I heard he, he wanted to make the guy delete it from the interview because he didn't want people to know that he had bad iPhone recordings because he didn't want the world to hear something that he like, hadn't properly <laughs> produced. God, that's, that's pretty ridiculous. Yeah, he was fine. He was like, "No, nah, it's okay. I'm being ridiculous." Like, yeah. I, think, I think he, he it's a bit it, of like an OCD kind of. Yeah, thing. but I but I know what that that feeling can be like, yeah. where you just yeah, you don't want anyone to to see that sort of unfinished side of things because yeah. you you want to. No, they they just pop out perfect, you know, <laughs> mastered and mixed and yeah, everything. yeah, all done. I don't know. It's I guess it's sort of wanting to always be presenting the best version of everything it is that you you are or you do do you, are you have you gotten better at um the process as the years have gone by do you think being gentler on yourself or never struggled with that anyway yeah i don't know i, I think i am actually reasonably hard on myself or just you know i always think things should be better than they are mm -hmm. but sometimes you just got to realize like that's that's enough you know uh, and obviously that can be hard, like, because obviously with the other guys in the band, like sometimes, you know, I've got an idea in my head that we just can't get to. Or the right. other guys don't know what that idea is. But, it, you know, it's sort of like can sometimes be hard to, you know, if the expectations are sort of set so heavily in a certain way. Well, it's uh, this floating ambiguous thing inside your brain as well. Yeah. It's, 
<laughs> exactly. I don't even know what it is really. Yeah. But yeah. I just I'll, I'll know when it's right. <laughs> yeah. But often that I know can be when a... you're fucking playing that guitar part <laughs> right. It will be right at the yeah. moment. It's wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's all I can tell you. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah. So that's that's probably a bit annoying for my bandmates sometimes. But I'm sure you know. I think they're probably the same in their own ways. With but it's been what 15 years nearly as a band, close to that. Yeah, it would be, which which is just crazy. Mm. The communication and the language and the, f- the way you yeah express those things to each other must have gotten better after all that time. Yeah, I mean it's a well worn path, I guess. So we sort of have a bit of a um, you know kind of a I don't know what it's ESP, but or telepathic kind mm, of definitely. thing where we just know each other so well, like we know almost what each other is thinking a lot of the time, mm-hmm. you know, when we're recording or touring or whatever. But that's that can sometimes be bad too. Like you sort of need, you know, sometimes you can, you know, almost there's not enough said. Like you need, some, you know, like a producer or someone to just jump in and say something dumb, you know, that kind of breaks the ice or sort of like allows you to just yes. sort of go in a different direction or, or not go down the same sort of well-worn path. So, so it can kind of be both good and bad sort of being so familiar <laughs> Is that the, those are the longest relationships you've been in is with those guys? Apart from your family? Yeah, I mean, it would have to be. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, which is, that's that's a pretty crazy way to think about it. Yeah, that's definitely, (laughs) I've been thinking about it. Uh, Yeah, all my bandmates are my longest long-term relationships of anything. Yeah, and you probably, you know, you spend more time with your bandmates really, you know, at least as much time as probably your your closest friends and loved ones. Yeah, absolutely. So so it's pretty significant. Yeah. Been through lots of um hard conversations and sit downs and emotional breakdowns yeah. and, and everything. Huh? Yeah, no, the highs and lows for sure. But I guess that's part of it, you know, you kind of those things make your relationship stronger, I think. You know, sort of having those tough moments and, you know, a bit of adversity along the way I think sort of makes everyone yeah, a lot closer. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that is a that is a huge part of it. But the other thing for us, I guess, is you know we're we're so close, but then we actually all live in different countries, right? So uh, I guess up until uh, yeah a few months ago, I was living in Denmark. I was sort of there for uh, why Denmark? What was it that attracted you? Uh, just just a place that I guess we'd been to a few times um, with the band. I really liked. Just sort of felt like a change and. Um, yeah, there's a job opportunity for my my girlfriend over there um, to work. So yeah, just sort of it all kind of fell into place. Okay. Um, and and yeah, we wanted to be in Europe, I think. Or you know, I, I sort of wanted to change from being in Melbourne, even though I love it. Uh, just just to sort of get a bit of a fresh perspective, and and being in Europe was exciting, I guess, because you're just sort of near so many different cultures mm. and places and you know just obviously living in australia Denmark's cool as well yeah, well, Den- yeah exactly <laughs> denmark's just cool so that's that's probably the short answer um but uh but yeah just sort of amazing like growing up in australia you're sort of used to i guess sort of you know you can't really go anywhere for the weekend you can't you know fly overseas for the weekend or things like that whereas in europe you know you can trip down to italy or yeah, you know it's very true you know head to I don't know, the Balkans or sort of to the UK or wherever, like, you know, just do like a weekend trip and be back in time for work the next week, which is sort of phenomenal. But but you just realise how isolated Australia is by comparison, you know, when you get that that chance. And, and that's sort of something that, that was interesting to think about. There's a thing I notice when you come back to Australia. I mean, I just sort of moved back from L.A., and I'd tell people that I'm going back and it's like they think I've given up or I'm retiring. You know, like, oh, what, you're going back? Oh, that's it. Career's over. He's given up. Like, man, I can go live anywhere I want for the next fucking 30 years if I live that long. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes you've got to check back. Oh, you'll never make it in Hollywood now. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah, he went back to Dreams over. <laughs> I know. No, I, I, I think we sort of had the same thought as well, like that it might seem... Oh yeah, we didn't want it to seem like a backward step. Well, I, I didn't want it to seem like a backward step coming back to to Melbourne. And it, you know, it was always sort of on the cards to sort of come back. Like it was always sort of a temporary thing to go and visit, be in Europe for a year or whatever. And we ended up being there for three years. So um, it was it was a longer and sort of more awesome journey than probably I originally thought. But but yeah, just you don't want to come back and almost just like like life regresses. You want to be 
you know, you want the journey to be forward, but but in a place where you've been before, if you can kind of do that, like take the the learnings from being in a different place and improve your your way of living or the quality and of your life. So you've been back what four or five months or something? Yeah. How's it feeling? Good. Yeah. I mean, it's You're feeling a f- sort of fresh take on things here. I think so. I mean, it's. I guess that's the challenge, probably as time wears on, not to just fall back into old habits. But, but if that happens, then you'll probably just leave and go somewhere else again. Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't. I don't feel. Yeah, I don't feel you seem too like bad. A progressive person. That's right. right. Yeah. That's right. I'm not that stupid. Um, and and that's definitely sort of on the cards. Maybe sort of living somewhere else at some stage. But um, but no, I think I guess the good thing is just coming back and you know, there's a lot of amazing things about um, Australia and. You know, even in a similar way to Denmark in some respects, like being on the you know slightly more socialist end of uh, you know a democratic country, not as much as Denmark, obviously, but um, but you know life, you know, there's a lot of sort of you know social infrastructure and kind of uh, you know people's lives here generally are pretty good, mm-hmm. uh, and obviously the weather's pretty good, especially yes. compared to Denmark. <laughs> so that's that's one thing we've got on them, but. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's just sort of nice getting a perspective on things, and and I kind of love, yeah, just being in a different place. And um, I, I guess it's like when you, you know, for us, often when we go and record, we'd record like in a place that's not our home. You know, we'd go to, I don't know, go to Paris or go to um, Atlanta or I don't know places we've made records where everyone's sort of out of their comfort zone. I think that's kind of good sometimes to not I, I you know, completely agree. be in the yeah. same environment because things just become a bit too familiar and it's... Oh, Any time I've recorded here, it's not been great. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Every time I get away, I just the focus changes. It's like, right, we're all on the mission together. We're doing it. But when you do it... If, yeah, if you, when you have lived in Melbourne and a bunch of us have lived here, it's just too easy to know that you can go and get falafel after the after the recording session or that your girlfriend's waiting for you at home. It's yeah. Like, it's too comfortable and yeah. the camaraderie disappears a wee bit. You're not the same. Yeah. And also just the, I think you're, I think you're just a bit more sensitive or kind of uh, aware of, of things when you're in a new place. Mm-hmm. It's like you, um, it's like getting off a plane, you get this little adrenaline rush. You know, <laughs> yeah, and, it's and true. It's sort of, definitely true. Yeah, you're kind of just like a bit more switched on. So I think I think that's sort of something that's important as well to feel like things are not completely as you. Know yeah, there's them no, to com- be. not a complacency. Definitely yeah, yeah. When you when you're somewhere else like that, huh? Did it feel like that in Denmark for those years while you were there? Yeah, well, that's that's what I was. Yeah, I guess yeah. what I was meaning. Like it, it's kind of good to be in a new place, and you know, everything seems new and feels new. And so I think the way that you approach you know, music and creative stuff is, you know, affected by that in a good way. That was a good creative time for you, do you think? Yeah, I think so. Mm. And even like, I guess because we were touring through a lot of that, like touring the the Haiku album through a lot of that. So I wasn't necessarily there, uh, you know, on a big, long, extended yeah, period the whole time. Yeah, you band who's yeah. coming and Yeah, exactly, <laughs> floating in and out. Yeah. So, so that's sort of... Um, you know, it wasn't sort of full time, but but definitely it, it was nice coming back to something that that you know felt a little bit different, but still you know wasn't like hard different. You know, it wasn't like a, a real grind. It was it was nice. Yeah. So so that was really cool. Hey, thank you very much, Dan. That was a real pleasure. I never know what to expect with people on the pod- podcast that I haven't properly met before. Obviously, Mark Baker had spoken very highly of Dan to me but I'm always a touch nervous before every interview you know I never quite know what I'm getting myself in in for but he was such an easy guy to talk to very chill very thoughtful very intelligent that was a real treat thanks Dan if you haven't check out the new cut copy record the latest cut copy record rather it's not that new but you know as far as you go it's new enough Haiku from Zero it's a sick record one of my favorite tracks is Standing in the Middle of the Field, which we talked about briefly. It has that kind of, that special kind of melancholy and that feeling that we are discussing. It's a very cool tune, that one. And also another standout for me is a song called Airborne. It's a banger. It's got a great, got great bounce to it. Really interesting textures, textures, excuse me, that, that cut copy kind of textural thing that they do. Top stuff. Well done, fellas. Album number five and still going strong. It's a really, really good one. All right. Hey, I think that will do us for today's episode thanks so much for tuning in 
plenty more coming. There's always lining up more guests while I'm here in LA and for back in Melbourne when I head back. Until next time, take care. Keep it foolish. Yup.